This is my take on the topic SQL versus NoSQL. Um, I'm Jens Wilke, and uh, I go by the name, uh, by the nick uh, Traptex. Uh, you will find me on Twitter, GitHub, and I also blog sometimes. Um, uh, yeah. I'm an open source developer. One of my projects is Cache2K. That's a Java in memory cache. And I also run a boutique software shop in Unix, which is called <coughs> Head Issue. And I'm involved in a couple of startup stuff. My database background, besides uh, a lot of other things, like I've been around for a couple of years. I, I wrote actually a Java database engine back in 2000 for a German setup box. Uh, yeah, without any SQL, so it's no SQL, so that name didn't exist by that time. I wrote two ORM persistence layers. I did some database related bachelor thesis and uh, Technical University of Munich with Professor Bayer who invented the entries. And I'm a happy Postgres user since 1999. <laughs> so yeah, why this presentation? Because um, I'm involved with startups and I see a lot that they make interesting choices because they don't know better or they go for obvious modern <coughs> stuff. And uh, sometimes things go not the way that they're supposed to. Be, and they struggle with simple stuff uh, to run with uh, on, on NoSQL databases. Um, so yeah, this is my condensed things about what you should keep in mind. Of course, I cannot go in, into the very detail. And actually, this is about opening your minds that there are a lot of details to think about. So. Why no SQL at all? Of course, the first thing is the scaling issue. Like, there's this new term called web scale, which is massively scaling things. So whenever a startup is making their initial architecture decisions, uh, they go for, oh, we need to have this massive database. And then, of course, there's this special purpose stuff, like document stores, types of data. That more fit to a special usage scenario. And there's this other thing. SQL sucks. Um, yeah, there's a blog post that I that I found uh, that goes into detail why SQL sucks. And the funny thing is like at the bottom of the talk you have uh, lots of comments and I um, picked two of these comments. Like the one is like, oh, SQL is fun to learn and so great and what, whatnot. And the other thing is like, I hate SQL. I can write HTML and JavaScript, and but SQL. It's like someone decided to give a genetically engineered gorilla the opportunity to write code. And there's this other thing that's the mismatch. So there's the relational model, which actually fits to nothing we write our code or structure or data. We, we have like objects and the class model. There we have JSON data, we have XML data, we have graphs. And this relation, relational model actually is doesn't actually fit to, to any of it. It's just, it's not meant to fit because it's a universal thing, but it does fit. Okay. And there's the other thing. Uh, everything should be simple. No SQL, a schema, as you can just store the data as you have it and put it into the database and you can do something with it. OK. I say SQL is cool. Yeah, you have all these issues. But OK, like much of the misunderstanding comes from uh, the different approach of uh, language. It's different from a programming language. Because the programming language says, OK, it's imperative. And we go sequentially and say, dear computer, do this, do this, do this. And SQL is different. 
SQL is a declarative style. Uh, you say to your database, this is this is the thing that I that I want to know, and the database decides for you what it's doing actually to carry uh, to to do its operation. And well, I know there is a lot of legacy in the SQL syntax, which makes it really really hard. There is like a lot of legacy in other kinds of stuff, like the Unix DD command is a nice example. So, NoSQL, really? Um, so, I think the term NoSQL needs to be replaced actually by another term because um, a lot of modern databases actually SQL is back or comes back because um, at some point um, you need a query language that everybody understands and that where it has a common standard. And so there are a lot of modern database systems which are distributed, um, which are like which have a special purpose mm -hmm. that actually also use SQL. And there's another thing that also query languages that are invented for NoSQL databases actually look a lot like SQL. And I'm not so happy with that approach because it's a lot of very error prone and very hard to understand if you have a lot of languages <coughs> that look similar but are not. Okay. So, yeah, when you want to have fault tolerance and scaling, uh, yeah, we are talking about distributed systems. And uh, in the year 1998, <coughs> uh, Eric Brewer came up with the cap theory um, to uh, get better understanding what are the actually problems and limitation when you do a distributed database. Um, what he said is actually that you uh, that there are three things um, that you maybe want to achieve. That's consistency, availability, and partition tolerance, but um, you never achieve all three of them. You gotta pick two. And um, here is like a, a short uh, try to put uh, the existing stuff into a category so the traditional uh, database stuff is more in the CA, like you have consistency and availability, but no partition tolerance. Um, so this is a try to put the databases into uh, these categories. Uh, I took this actually from a blog post uh, from 2010. Um, there's a lot of discussions where to put actually this stuff. And it's quite funny to see that uh, MongoDB is like in the AP area, <coughs> and um, yeah, more, more, more about this later. So there are a lot of details um, with distributed databases, NoSQL databases. Like um, there, the first thing is there are a lot of smart algorithms theories. And then there is like um, idea, like an idea. Um, it's something 2008 came up by the CTO of Amazon, Gary Fogels. There is some um, need to develop an idea about what actually means consistency to you, and like how it is actually the semantics of your database that can be very, very different. Oh, consistency. Um, yeah, um, there's a guy called Kingsbury, uh, Kyle Kingsbury, which is doing the Jepson reports. Um, this is actually a test suite that he runs continuously on you know, different kinds of NoSQL databases, and he finds interesting things about um, their whether some assumptions about consistency hold or not. And 
2017, in February, he ran his stuff on the Mongol TV that um, was coming up. And there, it's like, I just randomly like picked some, some stuff here, and he says, like, yeah, the Mongol TV needs zero replication protocol is intrinsically unsafe following the loss of majority committed documents. Um, so, actually, this is a good thing because somebody is actually looking into this stuff and uh, makes, I like, pinpoints problems. And MongoDB invested a lot in fixing those problems and um, formulate some ideas, guarantees that you can have on consistency when you use MongoDB. So um, I think this is kind of cool and groundbreaking stuff that MongoDB is, is, is doing. Other uh, NoSQL vendors try the same, but um, you need to find out by yourself like what, what uh, consistency levels you get and how the database behaves. It's not so structured. Yeah, a wrap up on this. So you'll find a lot of scary stuff about your famous NoSQL database in the Jepson report. If you don't find anything, then it's even more scary. Rumble in the NoSQL paradise. Oops, we gotta earn money. So there's this example, right? They uh, it's a distributed key value database. The major driver was a company called Bajou Technologies. The initial re the release was in August 2008, and in mid-2017, Bajou runs out of money. Um, last year, they made their first community release, and yeah, the licensing is Apache, so it was able to like, take over the project by the community. And like, for me, I did also invent my own database stuff. I always look at here and say, oh, they, they are doing cool stuff and they are doing good. But uh, yeah, they went quite well until they went out of money. Okay. MongoDB. Uh, uh, it's a, actually a quite similar time frame. Uh, they did the initial release in 2000, uh, 2009. 2017, they didn't, they did not went out of money. Instead, they went IPO and got, got more money. And uh, in 2018, they have had a total funding of uh, 209 million and a revenue of uh, 154 million and actually a negative cash flow of 47 million. So mm, I'm not good like in reading financial reports, um, but I think they, yeah, they are still not on the positive side yet and we, do, we need to see how, how, the, story, how the story goes. Um, in October 2000, 19, they decided they changed the license um, because they say, okay, uh, people like Amazon are actually using their products uh, without giving, giving back, so we have a license now that forces Amazon to give back. Okay, but what happened is that this is actually not an OSI approved license, so they dropped out So uh, there's a lot of discussion about these licensing and whether it's actually an open source license or not, uh, whether it's allowed to get OSI approved or not. Um, like, here's my take on this discussion. Um, it doesn't matter actually whether it's OSI compliant or not. So whenever you, the, the more restrictive your license is, 
then the more you are killing the community that may or may not develop around your core product. And you have less adoption, you have less thinkers, you have less innovation in the core product. And the chance that, uh, that the product will disappear is quite high because um, there is no interest by the, by the community to, to invest in the product or maybe to fork or take over the, the product because um, you, can't, you can't change the license. Um, another thing is like, there is supposed to be the summer elastic search. These are in the um, ASF or the Azure Software Foundation area or like are Apache licensed. So PouchDB and Cassandra are actually Apache Software Foundation uh, products. And Elasticsearch uses heavily Apache stuff as their database engine underneath. So for example, Apache using is actually index engine. Elasticsearch is, is using. So those, those three I picked out Say, uh, to, to show you, okay, this is actually like at, at the other side. Um, those three products are heavily backed by a one, one company, but um, they are, on the other hand, rooted in the, uh, in the Apache community. What about the old guys? Yeah, PostgreSQL 1996. Uh, Initial release. There's a diverse community. They they have support for JSON. They have support for XML. They have solutions for high availability and scaling and all that stuff. But um, there's a lot of fragmentation um, with these um, options. Uh, there's there's different add-ons. There's different companies driving the stuff into different directions. Um, Unfortunately, there's no relevant Jepson test if you want to know about like your high scale uh, scalability solution with Postgres. That would be interesting. Um, but no but. I think you cannot have diversity, a diverse community without any fragmentation. So it's, there's, yeah, it's not possible. MySQL. Yeah, that's the picture of their, their book down there. Yeah, of course, they are they're getting into the same direction. And commercial vendors like Oracle um, and IBM DB2 or whatever, is that interesting? Yeah. OK. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. OK, they, they do the same. So they add support for XML, for JSON, and everything, so that you can just store your database, <coughs> your data format, and then let the database work on the stuff. Wrap up. Yeah. There are different directions of database. Like, the first one is like the universal, rational approach, the, the, the traditional approach um, with SQL, uh, for example, Postgres and MySQL, and there are more specialized stuff. Byte column source, document source, key value source, in memory favorites, time series, uh, databases, graph for triplet source, search engines, and streaming databases, and whatever. Um, there's no single reason to go for one database, in my opinion. Of course, somebody says, oh, you, you need to be highly scalable and you need to be super fast. But there are a lot of different uh, other reasons that you should consider when choosing the database. How many committers are on the core project? How does the community like, uh, look like? How many years is it around? How mature, uh, mature is this stuff? Like what I showed uh, early on the report from, from Jepsen about MongoDB was from 2017. Where he uh, discovered major issues in their consistency. It, it's just two years ago. Um, yeah.
So this is my takeaway. Um, I think every developer should know about SQL and have like a um, universal database in his or her toolbox. Um, it's not good in anything special in particular, but quite good in almost everything. And um, whether it's MySQL, Postgres, or the commercial guys, you can tune them in uh, a lot of ways in the direction you need if, if, you, if you have any special question need for that. If you want to scale, you can do that. And if you, uh, you want to uh, have like, uh, you need spatial indexing like for geographic stuff, you can do that with Postgres. Uh, and, and this extension, um, you can do a lot of things. And NoSQL is great because now there are even more databases that are specialized in a certain area. And go that as a you know, as a second step and say, okay, now need I now have an application that has the special need. So then there's a lot of nice databases to choose from. But then you should know about their semantics in, in, in detail and their limitations. So you really, really need to know about the detail. Okay. That's it. Thanks. Enjoy life.